Hello, social media world, LinkedIn, Facebook, wherever you might be seeing this live or being recorded. This is Coffee with Ryan, happens every second and fourth Monday of the month. And I'm always, always glad to have a special guest with me. And uh, this week we have John Wayne Truxel, um, retired uh, SEAC and Army Sergeant Major. Um, which almost that's easier for me because I hung out with too many <laughs> sergeant majors when I was in that. Um, that's another story. Um, but John, great to have you here with me. And hey, thanks for having me, Ryan. And uh, coffee with Ryan. I got my coffee. I'm ready to get after it here today. So yeah. Before I forget, I did. I forgot to do this last time that I had someone that wrote a book, and I feel bad. But I do just want to share. Uh, John wrote. Oh, wrote about uh, his story uh, in Surrender or Die, Reflections of a, of a Combat Leader. Um, and uh, I'm not all the way through, but I will say it's it's an easy read. It's enjoyable. Uh, it's interesting. So uh, if you don't have, if you're not familiar with the military community or you have someone, um, you know, served or you served, it'll be a great insight to what uh, veterans and active duty folks um, deal with, you know, in, uh, um, in their day to day in their lives and, and post. So, uh, now John, uh, I will say I have never heard of the SEAC position until a mutual friend of ours told me about you a few years ago. Um, and so it's been interesting to, to learn about, tell, tell me more about what that was and, uh, what you were, you know, tasked to do. Yeah, so the SEAC is the acronym, the rank acronym for the title Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It is the senior enlisted position in the entire United States Armed Forces. So to break it down, you know, every service has a service chief, you know, like the chief of staff of the Army, the chief of staff of the Air Force and folks like that. And then there's a senior enlisted person like the sergeant major of the Army and the chief mass sergeant uh, of the Air Force, the sergeant major of the Marine Corps, things like that. But what a lot, of, a lot of people don't know is that the senior military officer in the Department of Defense is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the head of all of those service chiefs. And that is the senior military officer in the armed forces who provides best military advice to the president of the United States. And the chairman's senior enlisted advisor is the SEAC. And so uh, I was the SEAC from 2015 to 19. During my tenure, uh, not only did I advise the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, but also the Secretary of Defense on all matters involving the enlisted force. So the bottom line, the SEAC, unlike you know a service position, doesn't have Title 10 authority, meaning the ability to create uniform policy, or regulations that get after the morale, welfare, readiness of the troops, you are basically in the art of influence and leadership. So to break it down, the SEAC really has two responsibilities. Uh, one, you are the only senior enlisted person that has a direct line to the chairman, the SECDEF, and on that behalf, the administration as well. So it's a critical position keeping the services in line and in the know of what's going on at the Department of Defense level. Uh, but to, the two main things that I focused on and that the SEAC should focus on is delivering the why to the troops around the world. You know, why are we doing operations in the Middle East or in Eastern Europe or in the Pacific? And, and the other one is gaining the pulse of the force for the chairman, the SECDEF, and the administration, and the Department of Defense overall. So because I would be on the road 270 days out of the year all over the world, visiting troops in all the garden spots, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, Yemen, you name it, I went there. I had firsthand knowledge of what the troops were going through and what they were doing in those areas. So when I came back, and would be in meetings with the chairman, the SECDEF, and the joint staff, the senior staff of the uh, U.S. Armed Forces and the Office of the Secretary of Defense, 
I had just been on the ground seeing things. So I was kind of like a directed telescope for the chairman and the SECDEF as well because of how focused they had to be in Washington, D.C. They couldn't get out as much as they would like to. So I was the, the kind of the agent to do that for them. And, uh, and that's what I focused on. And I will tell you, Ryan, over the four years from 2015 to 19 that I served as a SEAC, um, I will tell you that there was probably nobody else in the armed forces that had firsthand hands-on experience with the entire force in all of our combatant command areas of responsibility and what our services were doing. And I don't say that to grandstand. I say that because that's what my focus was. And I was out and about. And like General Dunford, who was my boss for the first 43 months, told me, I don't need you in the Pentagon. I need you out with a force telling me what the hell is going on. And so I did that for four years, traveling all over the world, to see the troop, what our troops are doing and in giving that pulse back, but also delivering the why. And the, the why is, you know, like, for instance, I, I, I went to Mogadishu, Somalia to visit our elite, our most elite Navy Special Operations Forces. And the commander of that uh, unit said to me, hey, how does this end? You know, right. I'm over here, you know, and, and we're trying to defeat ISIS and, and Al-Shabaab, you know, an offsite of Al-Qaeda and everything. How does this end? You know, what he was expecting out of me is you are an agent in Washington, D.C. You ought to be delivering this kind of information to me. And so after I kind of gave that guy the loser salute, you know, I knew then that this was one of my focus areas to translate campaign plans and strategy and policies down at the tactical level so that the men and women that were serving in these areas all over the United, all over the world knew exactly what was expected of them from our leaders in Washington, D.C. So that's kind of what I focused on. Again, when you're in the art of influence, though, you know, like the, the current SEAC is a Marine, Troy Black, a good friend of mine. Um, he's kind of doing what I was doing and everything. Uh, the guy before him, an Air Force guy, C.Z. Colon Lopez. Uh, did a lot that was service centric, a lot that was getting after stuff that affected all the troops uh, on Capitol Hill, you know, in terms of uh, benefits and and uh, pay and stuff outlined in the uh, National Defense Authorization Act. But the bottom line is your duties and responsibilities are defined in policy, but it's at the discretion of the chairman of what you do. And my boss, who, you know, Joe Dunford you know, nicknamed Fighting Joe Dunford. And then my other boss, Secretary Mad Dog Jim Mattis, they wanted me focused on the areas of contention, the areas of combat, and deliver that pulse back to them on that. And also that's the places, as you know, as a veteran yourself, that people really want to know what the hell is going on and how long are we going to be here and why are we doing this mission and things like that. So that's what I focused on. And for me, for the four years I was there, it was very effective. Yeah, you said something really interesting um, that, uh, and we, there's books been written about, more <laughs> books could be written about. We said the art of influence, um, you know, so huge. Uh, yeah. how, do you, how do you translate that into an organ, even just the the army alone is so massive. Um, and I actually remember having some conversations, um, you know, lower level, uh, very lower level uh, conversations with like my brigade, Sergeant Major and Commander about it. Uh, and I will say I was the, I, I was a uh, most random E4 you'll ever probably come across. But, um, but yeah, we had conversations about it. how do you translate this art of influence uh to something that's a really a global um you know global operation uh, yeah how do you get create create that buy-in yeah so first and foremost you have to be knowledgeable on mm. what you're going to talk about so for me um the joint staff did a lot of things for me in for if people aren't familiar with the joint staff it is the staff that advises the the senior military staff that advises the chairman and so um, every time I got ready to go and visit an area, I got briefings from the J5, the folks that uh, focused on the strategy policy and things like that. 
in these combatant command areas around the world, whether it was the Middle East, Africa, or wherever I was going. And I was constantly studying every day. Ryan, every day I left the Pentagon when I was there, I would take home a secret uh, satchel with me with reading material to continue to keep me educated. So the first and foremost, I had to be educated on the places I was going and the things that our troops were doing and what our expected outcomes were, were supposed to be. That's first and foremost. But then uh, as a leader, in order to gain, you know, influence uh, with the men and women that you're going to see and on a global scale, um, you don't want them to just hear your talk. You want them to feel your walk. As a good mm. friend of mine, you know, a, a very renowned author and leadership coach, John Gordon, used to say all the time. And what I mean by that is you have to show up with with passion, motivation, inspiration and providing purpose and direction that's coming from the strategic level that you can translate through the operational level to them at the tactical level so they get it and they understand. And so there's the education part that you have to be smart on the place you're going and what you're going to talk about. But then there's that, you know, inspiration that you have to bring. And it's got to be through positivity. It can't be through negativity. As you know, um, you know, when you're deployed or, or you're doing something, you know, and, you know, it's not a very popular uh, task that you're doing or mission that you're doing, there can be a lot of negativity that comes out. And I think as a senior leader, in, in reality, all leaders, you have to bring positivity to the most screwed up shit that, you know, troops may be doing. And you have to have a positive spin on everything. And so I, to give you a quick example, you know, I still spend a lot of time with the troops, and, and as you know, and with our veterans and with, uh, you know, elected leaders. I spend a lot of time in Washington, D.C., and there's a lot of negativity in our nation right now because of the polarization that's going on, you know, politically and everything. But when I show up, you know, and people start going down a route about negativity, I continually route that ship back to a positive spin on where we're going. You know, so when people say our military isn't what it used to be, I said, well, I can tell you this much, having been around the world a couple of times and and still, you know, traveling globally and everything. We are the number one nation for peace and security, the number one partner of choice. All right. Why does Ukraine want us? Because they know without the United States that other NATO nations would probably fall off of the support train. And pretty soon Russia may have a severe competitive advantage that would allow them to be successful in overrunning Ukraine. Second of all, you know, the, the Arab, excuse me, the Israeli, uh, you know, Hamas conflict that's going on right now. I mean, Israel knows that without the United States, that the Arab world could line up against it. All of the naysayers could line up against it. So I constantly try to put a positive spin on where we're going, you know, and not from a Pollyanna perspective, you know, as John Gordon would say, but from a perspective of I know that if, if we continue to get after this mission and we put a positive spin on everything we're doing, uh, you know, that we're going to be successful. You know, I, I, I hearken back, you know, to the old West with Billy the Kid, you know, probably one of the biggest rebels uh, in, in the old West, you know, and one of the most wanted men, you know, he was a, a killer and all these other things, but he was kind of a Robin Hood figure to some folks, you know, that were just uh, everyday people and everything. And when he finally got surrounded in a house and, you know, the U.S. Cavalry had him surrounded and law enforcement and everything. And he looked at his battle buddies and said, I love these odds. You know, he was outnumbered 10 to 1, but he was putting a positive spin on probably the worst situation that he could ever be in. And so um, being positive about things like that and being knowledgeable and then understanding the three tier system of strategy or strategic operational and tactical, when you walk in like that, bringing that energy, um, then you are really truly getting after the art of influence. Yeah. Uh, maybe on a different aspect, um, who, who would you say was the most influential for you in your military time? Well, there's a couple, I think at all levels, you know, I spent 38 mm -hmm. years in uniform, 
20 years as a command sergeant major. And I think at every level, and I write about this in the book, um, you know, I was constantly looking for mentorship. You know, when I joined the military, I had no purpose, motivation, direction, and arguably I lacked discipline too. And at every level, I was looking for mentorship, either, you know, consciously or unconsciously, you know, I was looking for somebody that could show me what right looked like and someone that can inspire me. And so, you know, it started off when I was a young private, it was a young sergeant named Roy Horn, you know, who was physically fit. He was uh, professional in, in everything he did and, and he was inspirational. But throughout my career, I've always had those people. And I will tell you, probably the most influential uh, is a retired command sergeant major by the name of Roger Blackwood, who I write about in the book, you know, and uh, he was, uh, when I first got to the armor battalion in the 82nd Airborne Division in the mid 80s, he was our battalion master gunner. He was the expert on the Sheridan tank, the weapon systems and things like that. And I learned so much from him there. And then when I came back to the division after leaving after a few years, he was my first sergeant when I was a platoon sergeant. And then ultimately during the surge in Iraq, when I was a striker brigade sergeant major, he was my division sergeant major. And at every level that I knew this man, he was constantly leading through his example. And he was a guy that I just wanted to emulate as I moved up. But even through the ranks, you know, when I got to the senior most levels, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, Marine General Joe Dunford, who was probably the best officer I ever worked with. Uh, and but there's others like Army General uh, Mike Scaparotti, who was my boss at First Corps and at U.S. Forces Korea and in Afghanistan. That was someone that I just truly looked up to. So I think throughout the career, um, as long as the service member is continuing to look for mentorship and how to grow, develop and get better, they're going to find somebody that impresses them and they say, I want to be like that person right there. And those are the ones I could name, but there's hundreds of others that have influenced me. And it, and it wasn't just superiors. It was some of my peers and my subordinates. And I write about this in the book about a couple guys uh, by the name of Steve Zebarth and uh, Jason Hewitt that served under me as my squad leaders and uh, things like that, that were just two of the most impressive non-commissioned officers I ever served with. And I knew then when I had those guys under my charge that they were trying to pass me up. So I had to continue to keep pace with these young bucks that were, you know, very impressive and and that had as much influence and as much professionalism and as much uh, in the lethality department that I had. So uh, I think it's, you know, and even now in retirement, you know, as a, a successful businessman now, you know, I, I look to you know, others that have been successful in business. And I continue to look for that mentorship. I continue to look on how to grow, get better every day. And so I think that's just a part of being something larger than yourself, that you're constantly looking for someone that can help you along your journey that will get you to a level that you didn't think you could get to. Yeah. Then, um, you know, how do you, then how do you go about being a mentor to someone else? Well, it starts off with your example, as I mentioned to you before. First of all, you don't, you can't go out and say, I'm going to be a mentor for Ryan Crittenden or, or for John Troxell or Joe Snuffy or whatever. Um, they have to come to you and they have to look to you for that kind of mentorship. And um, I think the best way you can be a, a potential mentor is through your example. And that's your presence as a leader, you know, um, and I talk to military leaders all the time about this. What happens when you show up in front of the troops at their workplace? Do they get excited? Do they want to bump fist with you? Or do they start rolling their eyes? Or do they start checking themselves out to make sure that they're not screwed up because they know that you're going to rip into them and everything? So your presence is everything. And again, I go back to what I said earlier. It's not just you wanting to hear them, wanting you to have them hear you talk. You want them to feel your walk and not feel in the literal sense, feel in terms of you get to the, their heart, you get to their soul by your actions as a leader. So it starts with your presence and your performance. Whatever you expect, 
men or women to do that you're in charge of, then you better do it with them. And even as the SEAC, every year, General Dunford and I took every services fitness test, PT test every year. We ran the Army 10 miler. We ran the Marine Corps marathon. Because in our minds, if we were expecting every soldier in the United States Army to do the Army PT test, and we didn't do it ourselves, especially me being a soldier, then we were hypocritical. So because we were responsible for all the services, we did everybody's fitness test. And we did it with the troops who were doing it at that time in the military district of Washington. And I think that's a great example of how you can continue through your performance to showcase that you're not above any standard that's expected out of your men and women. And then the last thing is being persistent uh, in balancing the art of influence. And what I mean by that, there's a humanity aspect of this that gets after empathy and compassion because you're dealing with beautiful human beings, all right? But then there's also the leader aspect of it that's about accountability and discipline. And the, the balancing act between those two will get after the productivity and efficiency necessary to be successful on the worst day of your life in combat. And so I think between those three Ps I talked about, presence, performance, and persistence, it's called leading by example. And ultimately, somebody is going to see that and be attracted to it and say, I want to learn more from this leader. I want to be just like that leader. And next thing you know, your text messages, Facebook messages, and everything are off the hook with people that want to interact with you, and they want to be a part of what you're doing. And I'll, I'll leave you this example, Ryan, on this subject here. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Tucson, Arizona, speaking at the University of Arizona, and I was speaking to the Navy ROTC program, the ROTC program that develops, you know, future Navy and Marine Corps officers. I'm an Army, retired Army command sergeant major, even though I was the SEAC. And I got in front of all of these cadets and cadre and spoke to them about the things we're talking about now. And you know, afterwards, I'm taking pictures with the cadets and everything. Well, a couple of days later, one of the cadre, a Marine Corps captain, wrote me an email and said how inspired he was by my talk and everything. And he asked me if we can stay in contact. And as he moves through his career, would he mind asking me for what I mind asking for him to ask me for advice? And I said, absolutely. Um, you know, whatever you need, I'm here to support you. And that's the last thing. OK is you have to be available. To be a good mentor, you have to be available. It's not just, you know, people reach out to you and they're looking for advice and everything. And, and you say, hey, thank you. It's humbling that you would reach out. You have to be available. OK. And, and so uh, that's, you know, through those three P's of leading by example and then being available and, and continuing to be the example. I think that's how you become a mentor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's great. I was thinking about, um, of course, for the people that have never had, you know, like two veterans talk to each other, you could sit for yeah. hours just telling stories of, uh, of really great, really great folks. And then folks are like, yeah, I met that guy, you know, or whatever. <laughs> but uh, I was thinking about this story uh, as you were sharing that I was, I, I was not maybe two months out of basic training, I ended up in Afghanistan. And really just crazy, crazy situation. I ended up with a different platoon. Um, they needed Joes and I was the Joe they didn't want. So I was the Joe they got, but uh, fortunately it worked out great. Um, but everybody worked out. And I was like, I don't, I don't know what to do in the gym. And, and I remember this, uh, <coughs> I went to my team leader. I said, Hey, uh, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, can I work out with you? And it was, he said, no, he goes, I, I just kind of work out alone. And I was like, well, okay. And so I, I left. Well, so I'm heading back to the bunks and, uh, um, a guy that we had just picked up in our, he, he, same scenario, random situation, ended up in our platoon. He was the new guy, but he was a, he was a staff sergeant. I think he might, he eventually became our platoon sergeant. Um, but, uh, I think he was my squad leader at the time. And he goes, Hey, 
aren't you in my platoon? <laughs> Roger Sergeant, he goes, what are you doing? I go, uh, you know, everybody's working out. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, so I'm just going to go back and do something else. He goes, no, come work out with me. And I worked out with him like every day for that deployment. And he's, I would still consider him a good friend today. And that was 14 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's, uh, I think it's really neat. So I think there's also an aspect of, you know, when you see someone be like, Hey, what are you doing? Yeah. And might even just say, I don't know, like just come be a part of what I'm doing. Well, you know, your team leader there missed an opportunity to mm -hmm. influence you. You know, a perfect opportunity in a in a you know in a very permissive environment in a gym, teaching a young troop you know, about physical fitness, wellness, and things like that. And so, you know, that's a little self-serving out of that leader. Okay, and missed an opportunity. And I will tell you that uh, the chance, you know, I'll ask you that, did you ever go back to that guy for advice on anything after that? You know, I, I mean, no. yeah. So the, the minute he gave you the Heisman on something mm -hmm. as benign as working out, now you're like, well, okay, this guy is just not, a, um, he's not approachable or anything like that. And there's too many leaders like that in the military and in business, Ryan, that they are so focused on themselves and so self-serving that when a subordinate reaches out and says, hey, I'm looking for help, and they turn them off, and then they, they can't realize it, or they don't realize after that, that why is anybody coming and ask me for advice? Well, because you were an asshole when I just wanted you to, right. you know, help me out on something simple. And you think I'm going to come to you with something even more complex, like maybe an issue with family or one of my soldiers or whatever. It, you know, it's not rocket scientists, but too many times leaders, because they are so self-serving, they forget what it means to be a leader. So I'm glad you shared that story. Yeah. I, and I think about it, too. And, uh, you know, and he, I've, I've seen him a few times since I got out of the army. Um, uh, that squad leader who, yeah. Uh, and every time it's really interesting. Like I talked to his wife, um, and like, Hey, you know, how did things go down in, uh, Alabama or whatever? And he, like, Oh, you know, it went good, but he freaked the soldiers out. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? He goes, well, he didn't have any work to do. So he went and, worked on the Bradleys with everybody and they, they were like, are we doing it wrong? He's like, no, there's just no other work I need to do. So I'm going to come down and help you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's just really neat that, that leadership aspect of, you know, obviously there's certain work only you can do because you're in that role. But as soon as he's done, like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go be with my people. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. That's neat. And so, even if bringing energy to what they're doing, you know, yeah. and, you know, just being there. And that's what I, I call leader presence, you mm -hmm. know, it's just being there with them, not micromanaging, not, you know, being critical of what they're doing, but being helpful, you know, and, and also, you know, bringing, uh, you know, a bit of energy and, and inspiration to what they're doing and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even to this day, like, I always think, I always think his name is David. Um, I won't call him out too much, but I, I think about David all the time. And uh, when I eventually write my book on leadership, that that David will be in there, um, you know, about that example of like just taking me along. And um, yeah, of course, I didn't continue with working out, but that's uh, more on me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, all, it's all good, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I'm curious, um, how does someone get a. Uh, a position like a SEAC or, or sorry, major, you know, I know there's different commands um, or even just a non-command sergeant major. Like how do people get these different kind of roles? Um, yeah. Yeah. So first of all, I think, you know, every day as a leader, you have to prove yourself, um, you know, to the, to the men and women you lead um, to the commanders that are, you know, relying on you to, you know, be the best advisor you can be and everything. And I learned at an early age, you know, <clears throat> that 
you know, the more I applied myself uh, and strove for excellence in everything I did and then set an example uh, that inspired others to come behind me, that all of a sudden, you know, not only was I getting better as a leader, but promotions and advancement were coming my way because I was focused on being the best that I could be. And, you know, here I was a 19 Delta, an armored reconnaissance specialist. And, you know, I spent a lot of time in the 82nd Airborne Division. But, OK, what does it mean to be a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division? I thought, OK, I have to be a jump master so I can put my soldiers out of airplanes. It, the expectation back then in the 80s and 90s was that if you were an enlisted leader, it wasn't if but when you were going to go to ranger school and be a ranger. And then what other things were you doing? to enhance your who you were and what you were as a leader. And so I was a sergeant first class when I went to ranger school, you know, and normally, you know, that's E3 to E5 level business and, and second lieutenant business. But I knew that if I was expecting anything out of the men and women in my charge, that I needed to go and set the example. And I did that. And, uh, and the same with being a jump master and everything. So the more I through the 90s that I continued to try to be the best that I could be and then try to bring out bring out the best in my soldiers, uh, the more I was looked at as someone that was trusted and someone that, uh, you know, people wanted on their team. And then once you get into the command sergeant major world, you know, you go through the board process of, you know, like for me, it was, uh, you know, the CSM board. And I was selected to be a battalion level CSM. I ended up being the CSM of 3rd Squadron, 17th Cavalry, and the 10th Mountain Division. And then after that, based on your rep- reputation, this was back then before what they the system they have now, it was who the commanders thought they could really trust. And so that's how I became the 2nd Striker Cavalry Regiment Sergeant Major and then 4th Striker Brigade 2ID, being the first armor guy to be an infantry brigade CSM for, of a striker brigade. And then after that, the non-process, you know, the nominative meaning working for general officers and flag officers, it's all about your reputation. And it's about what you can bring to the table. And does that commanding officer, that selecting official, have trust and confidence that you're the person that can get them there? And so that's a very meticulous process. And people say all the time to me, well, shoot, man, you, you went all the way to the top position in DOD. What people don't realize in, on nominative level selections to work for general officers, I was barely over 500. I was five and four on slates, meaning I was selected five times, but I was non-selected four times. And one of the times I was non-selected was by a guy named Dunford, who in the end was a guy that selected me to be the SEAC. So when you get to that level, uh, you know, it's like being in the mafia. It's business. It's not personal. And because if there's five people that are competing for a three-star level position as a senior enlisted leader or sergeant major, you know, there's the differences between each of you is paper thin. And in the end, it's the interview process where that commander says, I feel most comfortable with this person here. And so four times I didn't get selected. Five times I did get selected ultimately as the SEAC. So um, my advice in all of that to anybody that is, you know, is serve in the position you're in now to be the best that you can be. And as my mentor, Roger Blackwood used to tell me, you know, hey, I'm going to I'm going to do this job until somebody tells me to do it different and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. And so <clears throat> be focused on who you are and what you are right now, because when you get selected for promotion or higher level positions, it's because of your potential. It's not so much you know, hey, th- what you've done, it's the potential that commanding officers or selecting officials think you can have at the next level. So focus on what you're doing now, but strive for excellence in everything you do and draw that out of the men and women that serve under you, because the more organizationally you are reaching untapped potential and you are, you know, getting into a band of excellence, others are going to notice that and say, that's the catalyst for why this is happening. And I want that person on my team. That's basically how you get after it. But understanding every time I was a non-select, I I had to put my retirement paperwork in because I thought, okay, you know, it's time for me to go. 
but then another slate would come up and, uh, and, and I would compete and I would get selected for that. Now I will tell you a former Sergeant Major of the Army, Ray Chandler, a good friend of mine, he put a lot of uh, focus on me as long as, as well as others like Dan Daly and, and guys like that and sent us to advanced schooling that helped us a lot. You know, I'm a senior fellow at the Asia Pacific Center for Strategic Studies in Hawaii. I went to a course with general officers at uh, the University of North Carolina Business School, the Keenan Flagler Business School. I did fellowships at, at, along with general officers at Southwest Airlines and at Exxon Mobil. So I did things off the beaten path that normal sergeant majors didn't get to do. And what that did for me is it made me very comfortable uh, advising general and flag officers and operating at the operational strategic level. So I think the way we're doing it now uh, in the military, there's more opportunities for senior enlisted to grow and develop outside of the normal bailiwick of being an infantryman, an armor, a logistician, or whatever. But I will tell you what holds some enlisted back is um, they don't take those opportunities or more importantly, they shut off the learning and think that I'm at this level now. I'm expected to know everything. And uh, and in the end, you don't know half of what you need to know, which is why you got to be a learning leader every day. And I think that's the bottom line. The more you're a learning leader every day, the more opportunities will come your way. Love it. I'm just taking a few notes. That's great. All good, brother. All good. Can I... Uh... Can I still learning leader or is it absolutely? Is that, did you steal from someone else? Uh, yeah, Roger Blackwood. <laughs> okay, I was, you know, there's only you know, you, there's only one thief in the army, right? Yeah, I, I Ryan, you know, this is what's you know, leadership being an art mm. is that plagiarism is authorized as long as it is in the art. The minute you get into the science business where people have written papers and you know, people steal that and then put their name on it, you know, and everything. That's when it goes bad. But all in the art of influence and the art of leadership, I have learned so much and applied so much from leaders that came before me and leaders that came after me have have used what I used. You know, the bottom line is this is a big tug of war match in the in, in the span of time. The people that educated me, and I grew up under the Vietnam vets and and, and everything, and, and that were part of the embryonic non-commissioned officer education system in the 70s. I was pulling them in to the 80s and 90s. Don't get me wrong. In order to remain, remain relevant, you know, we have to change and we have to evolve. And there are those that are sergeant majors now that are pulling my leadership lessons into this world right now. And so it's just one big tug of war of continuing to pull and pull to get those lessons learned and, you know, tried and true ways of leading and influencing people to continue to stay at the forefront. Again, generations change, people change, and we have to evolve, uh, you know, along with the, the current and everything. But I will tell you that, you know, the lessons I learned from Roger Blackwood are still sound today. So, hey, feel free to use any and all, brother. Love it. Love it. Um, I guess, you know, we got, uh, you know, about 10 minutes left or so. Um, I don't I don't want to stack questions, but I'm going to I'm going to stack a couple at you. I'm sure you can handle it. Um, what's. As you got as you get through, uh, you know, traveling around. Like kind of what's a con what was a common theme of of needs that you were getting from soldiers? And then on the the second question to that is, what do you wish the civilian population, non-veteran civilian population understood about those needs? Yeah, so the the bottom line is when I showed up as the SEAC or, you know, as the Sergeant Major of all combat forces in Afghanistan, or as a Brigade Sergeant Major and a Battalion Sergeant Major in Iraq, <clears throat> it boiled down to the troops wanted to know what was expected out of them. Why are we doing this mission? Why are we here where we're at now? 
And where does this thing go to in the future? They wanted clarity of purpose. And I think that's one of the key things that leaders have to focus on. Clarity, you know, make, make it clear what is going on and what the expectation is. You know, and so as the SEAC, wherever I went, I wanted to make sure that the men and women serving around the world hadn't that we in Washington, D.C. had not forgotten about their service and the sacrifices they were making. Um, And I wanted to make sure that when I reported back to Congress or anybody else, that the men and women weren't just surviving out here around the world. They were thriving. And that we were still the greatest military in the world, even though we had unstable budgets and modernization had been, you know, put at risk because of those unstable budgets. And now, you know, with recruiting crisis going on and everything, um, I wanted people and I still want people to understand that we are the greatest military in the world. And, you know, which is why we're in over 160 countries around the world and save for a few like Syria or something like that. We're there at the behest of the heads of those countries, because they know if you got the United States as a partner, that you can continue to compete with China, you can uh, contain Russia, and you can keep terrorism and, and, you know, and, and Iranian proxies out and everything. And especially in North Korea, you know, the South Koreans know that North Korea isn't about to invade again. So I think that's critical there is that, you know, uh, you know, that the troops know what's expected of them and what the, and it's got to be an inspirational message. Second of all, what the American public needs to know, and I've really taken this on big time now, is that, you know, our veteran community, you look at any TV commercial that talks about veterans, it talks about veterans as being broken. OK, and uh, don't get me wrong. We have veterans out there that need help and they need help a lot. But our veteran community is thriving, you know, and I mentioned last week I was in Bentonville, Arkansas, and I'm around six other key veterans, one of them being my business partner, who all of us are thriving post-military life. We are 100 percent disabled. We have had battle injuries, things like that, but we're not wallowing that. We are focused on moving forward and getting better. And the American public has to understand that yes, post-traumatic stress disorder and physical injuries and, and, and uh, traumatic brain injury are realities for those that have served in battle and in, in the military, but that there are so many more positives that the veteran community bring to this nation and to corporate America in terms of our punctuality, our purpose, our, you know, just give me task and purpose and I'll move out and I'll get the job done, okay? And things like our aggressiveness to accomplish missions and everything like that. So the American people, when I hear, thank you for your service, you know, it's got to be in a way of thank you for your service and, I, you know, good luck to you in post-military life. It can't be thank you for your service, I feel sorry for you, and I'm going to buy your lunch for you, all right? Don't get me wrong, all of those you know, acts of kindness are appreciated and everything like that. But we have a veteran community that is not surviving, but thriving. Do we need assistance? Uh, Does our veteran community need assistance from Washington, D.C. and from our veteran support organizations? Absolutely, because we have veterans that are hurting out there. But by and large, our veteran community is one of the key reasons that the United States of America is the number one nation for global peace and security and the nation that others want to be around. And that's the message that the American people need to hear is that a the veteran community is thriving, not surviving. Love it. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. I think that's uh I think that is a great reminder and and even encouraging on uh you know, your everybody has bad days. And yeah, uh, and sometimes you struggle with you know, what you experience with in the military, but, uh, you know, just, you know what, that's okay. Like yeah, the next, hey, tomorrow's Ryan, the next best day, right? Yeah. Ryan, I've been in, I've been in therapy for, you know, <laughs> almost five years now for PTSD. Okay. But that's not what defines me is that I have PTSD. What defines me is what I do in my therapy to deal with my PTSD. Okay. Yeah. You know, my wife of 40 years, Sandra, she told me one time, you know, 
Hey, I, I, I don't leave. She does live inside my head like all wives do. But but she says, I don't know what's going on inside of you. OK, so my help is limited on what I can do for you. OK, but in therapy, that helps me deal with that. OK, I, like I said before, I'm 100 percent disabled veteran. I've got injuries from jumping and combat and things like that. But I don't let that define me. And, you know, and I'm not going out looking for, you know, you know, for people to appease me or to baby me. I'm looking to how can I get better every day? How can I grow and develop? How can I be better at taking care of my family? And how can I get better in my business uh, ventures now? And so I think that's, those are the stories you got to hear more of, as opposed to the stories where veterans are going in the other direction. Don't get me wrong, veteran suicide is an issue, and we've got to continue to get after the things that that get people ultimately uh, going down that road and everything. But there's far too many of us that are are doing great things, and those stories have to be told too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Awesome, Mr. John. Thank you so much um, for people watching later. Be sure to. Um, pick up his book, Surrender or Die. We'll have to have a, have you back again because uh, there was a few Absolutely. things I even wanted to ask you about this, but we'll uh, we'll get it on the calendar when you're not too busy. Um, yeah. Hey, uh, Ryan, thank you so much. One, thanks for your service, brother. And thanks for doing this kind of stuff because I will tell you, and you've probably seen this in the many shows you've done, this is therapeutic right here. When two old war horses like you and I can get on here and talk about the profession and the art and everything. I think we, we all walk away feeling better about ourselves, you know? So thanks for the opportunity, brother. And it would be an honor for me to come back. Um, and I will tell you, I'm going to have to reciprocate and get you on my YouTube show leader talk one day. Absolutely. I'd love it. I'd, uh, love to, I love talking leadership and, uh, wrote a dissertation on it. Uh, that's not fun to read, but, um, <laughs> eventually I'll write another one that is fun to read. But connect with uh, John Truxel, uh, PME Hard uh, Consulting. He also has, uh, do you still have eTool Nation podcast? I do. Yeah. Awesome. So check that out. And if you don't know what an eTool is, uh, you are not a veteran. Um, so Google it. But uh, it'll be great. That's our guide, though. Um, yeah. And feel free always, you guys can connect with me at xlcoaching.net or Ryan at xlcoaching.net. Um, and we'll be back in two weeks with a great coach um, out of Wisconsin. John, thank you again very much. We'll see you all in two weeks.